Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we'll be looking at Hebrews 6, 1 through 9. Hebrews 6, 1 through 9. In these verses, for those of us who are really familiar with these verses, we know that <clears throat> this text contains teaching on the sufficiency of Christ's death. In other words, this text helps us to come to an understanding that Christ's death on the cross is absolutely, totally sufficient to save all to, who come to him in faith. And that's very important for us to understand. You know, sometimes I think in the midst of false teaching and the error that we hear being taught, we can quickly come to the conclusion that salvation involves God's work plus man's work. And you add the two together and you come up with salvation. Folks, that's not the case. When it comes to a scriptural type of salvation, we find that it is the work of Christ. Totally. It is his work based on what he has done for us on the cross and his following resurrection that is able to save an individual from their sins eternally. Let's look at Hebrews 6, 1 through 9. I think as we read down through it, you'll be able to understand a little bit more as we look at these verses. In Hebrews 6, 1 through 9, we're told, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Okay, that was Hebrews 6, 1 through 9. As we begin to go down through these verses, let's again be keeping our minds on the fact we're looking here at the very basic principle, Christ's death is sufficient to save all men eternally who come unto faith in him. If you notice in verse number one, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Okay, the writer of Hebrews here is saying, look, there are some very, very basic principles, some very, very foundational truths that a person needs to understand if we are followers of Christ. He then gives a list of those principles, and we'll look at those in just a minute. He goes on and says, let us go on under perfection. In other words, we shouldn't feel like knowing the very basics is where a Christian then should stop in his learning God's word. We should go on to perfection, meaning in completeness, where we should come to an understanding of the complete teaching of his word. Not simply the very basics, but we should go on unto perfection or completeness, where we're able to understand the Word of God in its entirety. That will be a part of what we'll be looking at here in these verses. Paul will be looking beyond the basic principles taught in the Bible, and he'll be helping us to understand some maybe more advanced things as we progress through these verses. Now he goes on. Not laying again the foundation of. Okay. Paul now begins by listing some of the foundational truths, some of the very basic truths that we all need to understand as Christians, but then we shouldn't stop here with these, okay? Here are some of the basic truths he mentioned. The foundation of repentance from dead works. In other words, the need for repentance, the need turn, to turn from our sins and turn to Christ as our Lord and Savior. And then, as we continue to walk in our Christian walk, the need to be repenting of our sins. When we see sin in our life, we need to turn from them as well. And turn to Christ and continue to follow Him. 
You know, as Christians, we all get off track a little bit every now and then. And Paul here, or the writer of Hebrews, whoever this might be, I believe it's Paul, but whoever this is, he's reminding us of the need of repentance, not only in the initial salvation experience, but also as we continue to live our life for Christ. He goes on and says, <clears throat> and of faith toward God. Not only is repentance necessary when it comes to salvation, but faith toward God is. Keep in mind, folks, when a person comes to Christ, he is turning from his sins and turning to Christ in faith, trusting in Christ as their Lord and Savior. That means when a person uh, experiences salvation, what has taken place in his life is he's come to an understanding of his sinful condition, He's come to an understanding of what his sin has done against the Lord. He has then turned from that sin and turned now to Christ, looking to him as his Savior, trusting in him that when he died on the cross, he paid the price for our sins, and also looking to Christ as his Lord, the one that he is to follow, the one that he is obey, to obey. That's all a part of repentance and faith. It's turning from sin to Christ and then by faith, accepting Christ as both Savior and Lord of our lives. goes on. Of the doctrine of baptisms, okay? Keep in mind, the Bible talks about different types of baptisms. It talks about a baptism by fire that will take place in the latter days. It talks about the need for water baptism especially. Once a person is saved, once they've exercised faith in Christ as their Savior, they're to make that public. So everyone knows they're saved. And how do they do that? By being baptized. That's what baptism is all about. It's making a public declaration of what Christ has done for us. So water baptism is very important. And that's a part of the baptisms we're talking about here. As well as the fiery baptism that will take place in the latter days. When Christ comes back to the earth. And purifies the earth from sin and sets up a new world for us to inhabit. He goes on. The laying on of hands, okay? Keep in mind. The laying on of hands back then involved <clears throat> the apostles having the gift that was given to them of uh, the different gifts that would prove they were from the Lord. Things like speaking in tongues, things like working in miracles. They were able to pass that down to other church members through the laying on of hands. Of course, we know that no longer takes place today. Those gifts have been done away with. But one of the types of laying on of hands that back then was still in existence was that laying on of hands of the apostles to pass their miraculous gifts down to other believers in Christ. But not only that, laying on of hands takes place today in the sense of ordaining elders, ordaining different men to different areas of ministry, whether it be a deacon, whether it be a missionary, whether it be a pastor. In today's time, we have churches who the godly men lay their hands upon that man, sending him forth on his way to do what God has bidden him to do in his new ministry. The ordination is basically what that's talking about there. Not only that, the resurrection of the dead. Again, that may seem like a mysterious subject. It may seem like something that is very difficult to understand. But here the writer of Hebrews is listing it among the very basics that we should know about. The fact that after Christ died on the cross, he didn't remain in the grave, but he rose again the third day. And we now as Christians are headed for a resurrection of our bodies. After we die, when the Lord comes back, he'll resurrect us and take us home to be with him. So that's all a part of the resurrection of the dead that we need to understand. And finally, of eternal judgment. Folks, how often have you heard eternal judgment taught lately? I'm sorry to say, but in many churches today, it seems like that's one of the subjects that pastors just don't teach much anymore. And that's a shame. Because the understanding of eternal judgment is a very basic principle that is given clearly and is spoken clearly in God's word for each one of us to come to an understanding of and then to go on beyond that in understanding other truths. And this we will do if God permit. Do you notice how the writer of Hebrews is laying everything upon the Lord saying, look, the only possible way we will come to an understanding of these basic truths 
And the only possible way we'll be able to go beyond those truths and learn new things, perhaps some of the more deeper things in God's Word is, if God allows us to do it. Folks, we don't have it in and of ourselves to come to an understanding of any biblical truth. It's only through the Lord's direct intervention in our life that we are given the ability to come to an understanding of the truths of God's Word. So here the writer of Hebrews says, look, if God permits us, we'll learn these basics, and if God permits us, we'll go farther and learn other things. But it's all going to be an act of God's grace in our life. We should never stick our chest out and, be, and proudly say, you know, look at all that I know about the, what the Bible teaches. Folks, if we know any truth at all from God's word, it's only because the Lord has given us the ability to understand that truth. And that's what the writers here of Hebrews is uh, reminding us of. So we're not to stop with the basics. We're to go on learning the deeper things of God. But as we do that, always keep in the back of your mind, it's only by God's grace we're learning any of these things. He goes on. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Well, wow, that's a long description of somebody, isn't it? Listen to what's said. This is describing a person who is truly saved. And listen to what's said in the very beginning, for it is impossible. He's reminding us what we're reading about in this verse is something that's impossible to take place. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened, in other words, the Lord had shown the light of truth to them. They had come to an understanding of the truth. They had seen their sin. They had seen their need of salvation. They saw their need to come to Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior. They saw all those things. They came to an understanding of these things. They came to an understanding of the principles of faith we just looked at in the previous verses. They've been enlightened. God has shown them the truth. That's describing a saved person. He goes on. Having tasted of the heavenly gift. What's the idea of heavenly gift there? Salvation. The people we're talking about have taken within themselves salvation. They've tasted. They've actually partaken of salvation. They haven't just seen others be saved. They haven't just come to a mental knowledge of understanding what salvation is, but they've actually partaken of it. You know, you can look at an ice cream cone with chocolate ice cream on it all you want, but it's entirely different when you finally taste it, when you finally partake of that ice cream, isn't it? That's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is describing here, a person who has actually partaken of, tasted the heavenly gift salvation and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost what happens when a person is saved the Holy Ghost indwells them the way the Hebrews writer describes it here is as being made partakers of the Holy Ghost where we are partaking of the Holy Ghost from the point in time we're saved on we now have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and have tasted of the good word of God. Again, they've come to an understanding of the principles of God's word. They've come to an understanding of how precious God's word is for their life. They've come to an understanding of how useful God's word is in their life. They've tasted God's word. They've come to understand how good God's word is. How beneficial it is. What a blessing it is to have in our life. Not like a lost person who may have a Bible at home, but it just lays there never read. To a Christian, they should understand the value of the Bible and see how good it is. He goes on. And the powers of the world to come. What are the powers of the world to come? Think about all the wonderful blessings await the Christian. Think about all the different blessings and all of the different promises that God has made to his people. Why are they called powers of the world to come? The idea of powers are the idea of authorities. Folks, it's going to be such a blessing to go home and be with the Lord and be perfectly under his authority. You know, 
the whole way of living will be entirely changed. In today's time, we have the government authorities over us. We have this authority and that authority over us. For those of us who work, we have our boss's authority over us. For those of us who, uh, you know, are, are married, perhaps we have the authority, the headship of the husband over us. Do you know what's going to happen when we go home to be with the Lord? He alone is going to be our authority. He's going to be over us. The powers of the world to come. The blessings of the world to come. Okay. So all of these describe a saved person. Now keep in mind again in the context the Hebrews writer is saying what we're about to read is impossible. It is impossible for certain things to take place. Okay, so here you have a totally, a perfectly saved person. One who is genuinely saved. It goes on and it says, If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance. The writer of Hebrews is saying this. Well, you know, before we start teaching that a, lost, that a saved person can lose their salvation, we need to really consider some things. Think about the implications of teaching it is possible for a saved person to fall away or lose their salvation and then try to renew it again. The writer of Hebrews says, stop and think, that would be impossible. Stop and think what it does to Christ's glory to say it's possible to lose salvation and then regain it. Think about what it does to the honor of Christ and what it says about the work of Christ on the cross to say a person who is saved can lose that salvation then they can regain it and down the road they can lose it again and they can regain it again they can lose it and they can regain it again. The writer of Hebrews is saying stop and think about what that does concerning the teachings of Christ and his work on the cross. Now watch, he develops this. He goes on and says if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. He said, for somebody to teach you can lose your salvation and gain it again is doing what? It is crucifying to themselves the Son of God afresh and putting him to an open shame. It's saying, look, for a person to say that you can be saved through the work of Christ on the cross and lose that salvation and then regain it, you're crucifying to themselves the Son of God afresh. Meaning, you're crucifying Jesus again. And here's why. Folks, we have to understand, when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, he died for all of our sins, past, present, and future. He paid the price for them all one time when he died on the cross. His death on the cross was sufficient to save any man, I don't care how sinful he is, if that man comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, his salvation has been secured through the death of Christ on the cross. Period. End of sentence. To say that person can lose their salvation is in essence saying Christ failed in his work on the cross. And here's why I say that. Now stop and think. If a person is saved and if they lose their salvation, what's going to be the cause of losing their salvation? It's going to be some sin they commit or some group of sins they commit. That's what's going to cause them to lose it. If those sins had been paid for on the cross of Christ already, if they had been done away with, if they had been forgiven already, how can they cause that person to lose their salvation? They've already been done away with by Christ's work on the cross. Do you see what it's saying? When we teach that somebody can lose their salvation, what we're saying is this. Christ's work on the cross is sufficient up to a certain point to pay the price for the sins a person has committed. But boy, watch out, because there's certain sins that Christ's work on the cross didn't pay for. There are certain sins that can once again separate us from God. If we commit sin X, Y, or Z, or a combination of them, we can be separated from God again. In other words, Christ's work on the cross doesn't apply to them. Somehow Christ missed them, or somehow he was unable to, to pay the price for those sins. 
Folks, that's a horrible thing to say. Because in essence, what we say is this. If a person is saved, if they can lose that salvation and regain it again, we're saying Christ must die on the cross twice. He dies on the cross to pay the sins for the initial salvation experience, but those sins he missed that allowed that saved person to be lost again, he has to go back on the cross and die again to pay for those sins so the person can receive a second salvation. That's why he says, what? He says, they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh or anew. By teaching they've lost our salvation and gained it again, you're teaching that Christ has a new crucifixion he's had to go through. He's had to die again. Folks, if Christ's work on the cross paid the price for all sin, past, present, and future, there is no possibility that a person can lose their salvation. Christ has already taken care of our sins we're going to commit in the future. Even the extra bad ones that are supposedly supposed to cause us to lose our salvation. Listen to how else he describes the implications of saying we can lose our salvation and gain it again. Not only do we crucify to ourselves the Son of God afresh, but we put him to an open shame. How's that work? We end up saying, Christ, your initial work on the cross wasn't enough. That's putting him to an open shame. That's saying my Lord and your Lord was not able to save us eternally. That's saying that my Lord and your Lord was not able to do the work necessary to secure us eternally. Somehow he missed something along the way. His blood didn't cover those sins you know, again, the special sins that make us lose our salvation. They, he covered all these other sins, but boy, those certain ones, whatever those sins might be that a false teacher teaches, whatever he says, you know, you, if you do such and such, you'll lose your salvation. Well, whatever the such and such is, Christ apparently missed him on the cross when he died the first time. Man, that is bringing him to shame. To say that our Lord, who is the sovereign king over all, was not able, his work was insufficient to save men from all of their sins. That is a shameful thing to say, and that's exactly what is said when people say that we lose our salvation and then we can gain it again. Folks, a person is eternally secure. Once we are saved by God's grace alone, we are eternally secure in him. Okay, so if that's the case, then why can't, a, why can't a Christian just sin all he wants? If Christ has really paid the price for the Christian sin, why can't the Christian then just not be concerned about sin anymore at all? He's secure. Christ's death on the cross covered those sins. Well, there's two big reasons and two things we have to consider. First of all, if a person is really saved and if they really love the Lord... If a genuine salvation experience has taken place, surely that person will appreciate his salvation to the point he'll want to please his Lord. Surely he will. He'll look and he'll say, Lord, after all you have done for me, the least I can do for you is obey you. So one of the reasons why a person who is saved will not just live in sin and not care about it anymore is because he loves his Lord. And he appreciates God's grace in his life and all the Lord has done for him. And therefore, he will be motivated to want to please the Lord with his life. That's the first. The, the other reason why, though, is it's make, that, too, is making a mockery of God's grace. If a person would be saved, and then... If that person turns around and just lives a life of sin, not caring what he does with his life, that's making a mockery of the Lord and what he's done for them. Remember, Paul talks about that. He said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And his answer to that was, God forbid. If we understood all that the Lord has done for us, and if we understood all the suffering that took place on the cross because of our sins, the last thing we want to do is sin. Our Lord paid a a 
horrible price for our sins. The least we would want to do is continue to live in them. So folks, it's important to understand that just because we teach a person who is saved is always saved, that doesn't give them a license to just live their life like they want to. If they've truly been saved, they won't want to live a life of sin any longer. And if they've truly been saved, they won't want to bring the Lord disgrace to his name by living a sinful life after all the Lord's done for them. But it doesn't change the fact that it is impossible for a person who is saved to lose their salvation and then gain it again. And the reason why that's impossible is because you're putting Christ to shame. You're basically saying what Christ did on the cross the first time was not enough to bring me security. You know, the, the teaching of eternal security of believers is one of the greatest doctrines in the Bible, I believe, because not only does it exalt the Lord as our Savior, but it also helps us to understand that he completely defeated sin and death when he died on the cross. Again, I say, if a person can be saved and then lost, somehow Christ didn't completely defeat death and sin. Somehow they got the victory in that case because you got a saved person now who's lost again. Okay. Let's go on because in the next verse then the writer of Hebrews gives us the perfect example of the very principle we just got in teaching. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. Okay, here we have two different types of ground being described. One type of ground has rain falling upon it often. Because of that rain, that ground is able to bring forth herbs that are useful to mankind. That ground that is rained upon is being blessed from God because it is from God that the rain flows. Likewise, the person who harvests then the herbs from that ground, they are being blessed of God because that herb that they're harvesting that they're going to eat is a gift from God based on the rain that he sent into the ground. Okay, so that's one type of ground. Set that aside a minute. Let's look at the other type of ground. The other type of ground, that which beareth thorns is rejected. Okay, what's implied? It doesn't get any rain. So now, instead of a, having a fruitful piece of ground, you have basically a desert type of piece of ground. It never sees any rain. The only thing that grows there are thorns and briars, things that really aren't good for man to eat. Again, if you can picture a desert compared to a fruitful field. That ground ends up being rejected. It's nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. What good is it? If that ground never receives rain, what good is it? Nothing. The only good thing about that is to be burned and set aside useless. <coughs> now you might say, okay, how does that apply to what we just looked at? You have to understand, <clears throat> this is an illustration of what we were looking at. The person who is saved is pictured by the ground that receives rain. So the rain is a picture of God's blessings falling upon that person who comes to salvation and then serves the Lord. Okay, so please understand what's taking place. You have a piece of ground. The Lord graciously sends his rain. That's a picture of the Lord graciously sending salvation to that person. Not only that then, once that person is saved, the Lord continues to graciously intervene in his life as he lives his life on earth. Because of the Lord's gracious intervention, both in his salvation experience and as he lives his life on earth, this saved person is able to bear fruit 
that is a blessing to others. That's the perfect picture of a person who is saved. They've been blessed of God and now they're living a fruitful life bearing the fruits of the Spirit and in doing so they are being a blessing to others around him. He's being kind. He's being patient. He's being merciful. He's telling them the truth of God's Word. The list can go on and on of the many ways a saved person can be a blessing to others around them. Okay. This other ground is a picture of a lost person. He never receives the blessing of salvation from God, that reign of salvation, if you want to call it that, based on this picture. He never receives God's intervention in his life in the sense that a saved person does, where you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, enabling you to serve the Lord. The lost person doesn't have that in their life, so the Lord's not intervening in that way. Therefore, the lost person's life only brings up thorns and briars. It's things, his accomplishments in life are things that will burn in the end. When everything is said and done, they're going to be rendered useless and burned. Not only that, but then that same lost person is headed for eternal judgment, whose end is to be burned. So not only are his works burned at the final judgment, meaning his works are revealed to be of no value, but then he himself is headed for eternal judgment. Now here's how this pictures what we've just talked about. What makes the difference entirely between the two pieces of ground? It is the blessings received from God. It's nothing the ground does. Look, the ground that makes up this desert type of ground, it could even be more fertile than the ground that, that uh, grows plants. But the difference is if you withhold rain from any plot of ground, I don't care how rich the soil is, you keep rain off of any plot of ground, the stuff in it will eventually die and that ground becomes worthless. So you can see the picture the Hebrews writer saying, saying, look, when it comes to our salvation, it is of God totally. It's nothing the ground does. The ground can't shut up the clouds and stop the rain from falling and therefore enter into a lost state again. Not at all. The ground is there and it's going to be totally reliant on the Lord's blessing to fall upon him for his salvation and for his continual service and fruit bearing for Christ. Totally in the hands of Christ. Why? Because his work was sufficient on the cross. Likewise a lost man. based on the fact that Christ has never graciously granted him salvation because therefore then Christ is not living in his life enabling that person to serve the Lord his life is living a wasted life do you see how again what's emphasized is the fact once you're saved you are entirely relying upon God's grace to keep you saved Likewise, if you're lost, your only possible hope is for God to graciously intervene. You can't even come to an understanding of the truth apart from Christ's intervention. You can't see your need of salvation apart from Christ's intervention. That's how blind Satan has made the lost world. It's only when Christ intervenes and through the sharing of the gospel message does a lost person ever see their need of salvation. It's through the Lord and him alone as he graces that lost person with the reign of the gospel message and then the reign of the understanding of that gospel message and the reign of the need to turn from his sins and turn to Christ in faith. You, know, you can go on describing all the different blessings that are received by a lost man that brings him to salvation. So folks, in closing, let me just say, in Hebrews 6, 1 through 9, when we read those verses, we need to make sure that we understand the basic, basic, basic principle involved. Christ is ever sufficient. His salvation is ever, ever sufficient. 
And it's because of that sufficiency, when he died on the cross for our sins, we have nothing to worry about losing our salvation. We shouldn't serve the Lord out of bondage, thinking we have to serve him or lose our salvation. We should serve him out of love and appreciation for all he's done for us. We should say, Lord, I appreciate you so much for saving me from my sins. I want to please you with my life. I want to do it because you've been so good. Not, Lord, I have to do it because I'm scared to death. You're going to take my salvation away from me if I don't. See, there, it's an entirely different attitude. It's an entirely different way of looking at Christian service if we do it out of a heart of love and appreciation instead of a heart of fear thinking if we don't serve him we lose our salvation instead we should be thinking I want to serve him the Lord's not being unkind to me and forcing me at gunpoint to serve him threatening to take my salvation away not at all I can serve him out of a free heart a loving heart appreciating all he's done for me I can serve him freely knowing I'm secure in him what a wonderful blessing it is. Finally, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. He says, we are persuaded you're going to learn even more things from God's word, better things. Things that go along with your salvation. Things that apply not only to your salvation experience, but then your walk of life as saved individuals, as you're constantly being delivered from the sin that's in the world around us. The writer of Hebrews was persuaded that through the Lord's gracious intervention, like the rain that falls, we're going to come to a greater understanding of truth, whether it be about our initial salvation experience or our continuing walk with him. And Lord willing, folks, this morning we started in that direction by coming to understand that we are to serve the Lord out of a heart of desire and appreciation, not out of a heart of dread and fear. I do want to thank you very much for joining with us. May the Lord bless you until the next time we meet together.